This is Buffalo's Uncensored Sports Show. You're watching Buffalo After Dark. Welcome to Buffalo After Dark, everybody. It is Wednesday night, June 5th. Of course, you got me, you got Hanson. How's your week, Ben? Uh, week's been good. It's just been going by very quick. Work has been chaotic as of late. Um, you know, I've been kind of been on the spot lately and just doing all kinds of running around and getting ready for the summer because most of you know I do manual labor work. So mm. I've been constantly asked to do multiple things at once, which is insane. You know, power washing, vacuuming, baseball fields, etc. So life's good in general with work. But other than that, eh, I'm okay. Yeah. Pretty much same here. Just um, finally stuff quieted down. I mean, I recruit as a day job and, you know, things are going well with that. So no complaints. And now, of course, we're just a little over about a month and a half before I head down there and uh, we do our little road to 32, which, yes, I will have the behemoth SUV again. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> God damn I don't it. I don't know if it'll be the Jeep, but I can guarantee you it's going to be either that, a Tahoe, an Expedition or an Amrata. So or maybe <laughs> the Yukon. We'll see. But I will definitely have the behemoth again. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. how I scared you shitless when I revved that 420 horsepower uh, twin turbo engine last time. <laughs> yeah, it's called guilty pleasure, my friend. Yep. <laughs> or as what they say for Mazda, vroom, vroom, except it's an actual Jeep. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> yeah. you admit it, you liked how fast that thing could go. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not complaining, but still. Yeah, <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Well, of course, as you guys know, we're recording Wednesday night. So as you um, see the episode, of course, uh, we appreciate you checking it out as always. And if you want to see any of our past episodes from this season, go to Spotify. We are up to date. So with that being said, let's kick off the show. We've got about an hour. So let's make a count. And the Stanley Cup, we are down to the finals. And praise the Lord. The Rangers are out. <laughs> Yippee ki yay, motherfuckers. <laughs> oh, oh, God. That was great. I got to say, I got to give Florida a lot of credit. That like, The way they're built right now, they're going to do some damage in this series. Oh, no doubt. But you know what? <clears throat> if you remember last week, I was saying to myself was, I was mentally prepared for a Stars Rangers Stanley Cup. I right. was totally on board with this because at the time I didn't think the Panthers had the firepower to get past the Rangers because Igor Shostak has been playing out of his mind all season long until up to this point, and the Panthers proved me wrong. They they played a great series against the Rangers, and the Rangers are not an easy team to beat in the playoffs. And the Panthers beat them with I wouldn't say it was it with ease, but it was definitely competitive. And I'm looking forward to what Florida does next. But as for the Rangers. They are going down a huge spiral. Like they, it's not even funny. Like there's a lot of Ranger fans mm -hmm. that are basically calling out the team, saying you guys need to make some drastic changes, like fast. Right, and and think about you know how things have gone uh, so far with with the club. I mean, Barkov's having a good series. Bennett's contributing. Of course, you've got Reinhardt contributing. Rodriguez has a little bit of a depth role. Stenland's doing the same thing. Tarasenko's doing damage like he normally would. They have good goaltending right now. And then their defense is playing out of their mind also. So, I mean, when you look at, at, at Belinskis, Benning, Bjornfoot, Ekblad, of course, as we talked about, OEL, Montour. I mean, they're pretty... Gustav Forsling. Yeah. Gustav Forsling was yeah, another one. Forsling's a great player in his own right. And then when you figure you have Bob Roski in that, I mean, you're stacked. They've oh, got yeah. a damn good goaltending roster also. Oh, yeah. And you know what's crazy is that Gustav Forsling, I think it was like two years ago, I think he was waived by Chicago or another team. Someone waived Gustav Forsling a couple years ago, and the Panthers picked him up and right away became a heavy like fan favorite. And he just got himself a handsome extension this past offseason. So good on him, man. A waiver claim that worked out very well for the Panthers. And he's one of the best shutdown defensemen in the league. Bar none. Absolutely. And it's kind of funny because even though we're not live, we actually just got our first comment. Or actually, I just got messaged <laughs> for for tonight. And it's our friend Brad, who's down in uh, the Louisville, Kentucky area. And he's like, any word on when live feeds return? And uh, right now, 
unfortunately, thanks to dumbass Zuckerberg, who took away the ability to actually live stream like perfectly easily through Facebook, uh, we're having to look at some alternatives. So we do have a new graphics system that works, which is great. <laughs> and it doesn't lag. We have a new computer system that works great. No issues with that. It's just the live feed, apparently, to YouTube or Facebook sucks. <laughs> so we're going to try to figure something out, whether it's either a different graphics platform or something. I mean, we want to get it live. But but no, thanks, Brad, for uh, giving us a shout out here. Uh, I know you like to listen to us live when you work at night. So so we'll get that. But, but no, back to what we were talking about, though. Florida is stacked. Oh, yeah, no doubt. And the crazy thing about the Florida Panthers is everything they've touched within the last couple of years, they have just worked out so perfectly for the Panthers. I mean, it's not even funny. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sergey Bobrovsky, who at the time signed his contract, I thought that was like the worst thing the Panthers did at the time. And they gave yeah. him a shitload of money. And now, looking back on it, it that paid was off. probably one of the – Yeah, and – that's probably one of the best contracts the Florida Panthers have given to any player in the history of that franchise. Yeah. And then thinking about some of the other players that they brought in, I mean, hell, you brought in, you brought Kulikov back <laughs> from when he played with the Sabres. A little depth, little depth role, but the nice part about what they've done, they've filled in the gaps where they needed to. I mean, they have solid three, four lines that they can work with offensively. You have three, four solid defensive pairings that you can work with, and they're all able to play in sync. They have a good system right now. And, and, and I would almost say they're like Tampa Bay several years ago when Tampa was building their franchise the way that they were. And you look kind of, I kind of see like some parallels with that because a lot of what Florida is doing now, they're getting super deep in terms of what they can do on, on the big club. They're getting super deep with what they can do in the farm system. But the thing is Florida got younger, which is paid mm -hmm. off and they've mixed in vets were needed and Tampa ended up getting dinosaur stone age to the point where they can't do anything at this point, except they're going to have to blow up and rebuild probably at some point in the future. I mean, at some point, they probably will. But I think based on what's happening right now with the Florida Panthers is just astounding because Bob has turned into a great goalie for the team. I think he's doing better in his tenure with Florida than he's been ever in the league since, like, with Columbus. Yeah. And then you also have to give credit to where credit is due. Bill Zito, the GM of the Panthers, was an assistant GM when Bobrovsky was in Columbus. So mm -hmm. he fully knew what he was getting himself into when he signed that contract a few years ago. I think it was 2019 when he signed that contract contract and then all of a sudden you bring in bob and it's like okay they got a goaltender they draft one like a couple of months prior in spencer knight who has been i'm mia now the last couple of years so it's almost like you don't really need him anymore mm -hmm. but at the same time though i'm not going to just give this all the credit to bob because they've also drafted a really good team within the last decade i mean think of who they've drafted they've drafted you know aaron ekblad They've drafted uh, Anton Lundell. They've, they've drafted mm -hmm. some really good players. And the yeah. other thing, too, is they've also gambled on, on you know, draft picks, like that Claude Giroux trade from a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. The Panthers don't have a first-round pick until next year. So they gambled away three first-round picks for Claude Giroux, who's not even on the team anymore. But at the time, that was what they were aiming for. Yeah. But they don't really necessarily need, you know, the first-round picks anymore because, again, they traded it all. But – They've also were able to work with the cap, which is fascinating because a lot of them have team friendly deals like Barkov, mm -hmm. uh, Ekblad's got a team friendly deal. Who else is on the team? Hell, that even has... Kachuk is not in a bad spot right now either. Yeah, Matthew Kachuk. That's that's another player. Matt I think Sanko, Everson, decent, yeah. decent contract also when he came over from the Blues. It's crazy to think about this because when they had Jonathan Huberto mm -hmm. for all those years. I always felt the Panthers were a good team, but they were never good enough to win the cup. Right. And it, all it took was that one trade, and I will never forget it because it happened on the day I got married, which was on July 22nd, 2022. Matty Kachuk got traded to the Florida Panthers, mm -hmm. uh, and it happened on the day of my wedding. And I was just sitting there thinking, wow, Florida really went all in. Yeah. And sure enough, they traded away Huberto. They traded away uh, Mackenzie Weger, who was a stud defenseman at the mm -hmm. time. But getting rid of all those players 
it was given the Panthers' flexibility to sign him to an extension contract right. to the point where he's their franchise guy. And now, if you look at what they've done with him, the Panthers have completely 180 the identity of the South. I yeah. mean, you, Tampa Bay has done it in the past. Carolina did it for one year when they won the Cup nearly 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. And now you have the Florida Panthers, who are yeah. now the new, you know, I would say, and I'm not exaggerating, but I think that – they're getting to the point of Kansas City Chiefs level where the team yeah. is so good that they're going to attract new fans to come, you know, root for them and be fans of the team. Because if you compare last year's team that went to the Stanley Cup finals and lost in five to Vegas, nobody expected them to make it to the finals last year. Mm-hmm. Nobody. Yeah. And look what they've done so far. They destroyed the Bruins. They destroyed the Rags. Yeah, and they um, and of course they took down Tampa. But yeah. if you look at last year's team and compare it to this year's team, this year's team is so much better. They're mm-hmm. more disciplined. They're more focused. They have a lot more depth and veteran experience, and they yeah. have guys that have been there and done that, like Vladimir Tarasenko. He's done it, so he knows what it takes to yeah. win a Stanley Cup. But then if you look at last year's team, again, nobody expected them to make it this far. It was more of just they were the worst statistical team in the playoffs, and here they are. They beat a 65-team win, Boston Bruins, and mm-hmm. then beat them in seven. And I was just like, what the fuck did I just see? Right. And then they steamrolled Boston. They steamrolled <laughs> Toronto. They swept Carolina. Right. And then, of course, they met their match in, in the Stanley Cup against Vegas. Right. But I think since then, I didn't know if last year was a fluke. Or if that if you know if it was just luck, I wasn't sure. But now, the last year was no fluke. The Panthers right. are a legit team this year. Exactly. And the market for them for years have been so bad that nobody really went to their games, and now all of a sudden people want to see them play. Yeah, and just even throwing some of the other ones out there. I mean, hell, they got Rasmus Asplund from the Sabers. They ended up getting Kyle Poso from the Sabers, so you get veteran depth there. Asplund's going to get a chance to play a little bit. Reinhardt, same thing, depth and experience from the Sabres. Then when you look at some of the other people that they have on the on um, for the forwards, I mean, you've got Lockwood, you've got Lomberg, you've got Lutstarnin, you've got um, Sam, um, um, Samuskevich, Sordiff, Stenland. I mean, you've got uh, Verhage even. I totally forgot about him. Uh, you've got some solid depth, and you've got some solid starters, and then same thing on the defense. So I look forward to seeing what they're going to do against Edmonton because Edmonton, I got to give them credit. (laughs) They came back in that series after Dallas got out to that quick lead, and Dallas just (laughs) fucking collapsed. Oh, yeah, and the funny thing is, I think (laughs) Yeah, you and I were talking about Edmonton a week ago. And we both said, you know, we weren't very sure if they were going to be able to keep up with Dallas. And then all of a sudden, they win three games, and they make it to the Stanley Cup Finals. And I'm just like saying, I don't know who choked harder, the narrative or the Dallas Stars. Yeah. I mean, Ottinger was playing well, but he looked like shit in that last game. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Big big time. But the crazy thing is about Edmonton is if you go back to, like, October, November, in the beginning of the year, the Edmonton Oilers were the one of the worst teams in the league. Yeah. This is when Jay Woodcroft got fired, and everyone said, well, the Oilers are done. You know, Connor McDavid is probably going to get traded. Leon Dreisaitl mm-hmm. is most likely gone. And then all of a sudden, here comes Chris Nobalt, who was the head coach of the Harvard Wolfpack, coming in from the New York Rangers. Yeah. And all of a sudden, within the six-month span before the Stanley Cup, the biased Canadian media, like Gino Renna and all those guys, they were all saying the Edmonton Oilers were the best team in the NHL within the last six months. And I said, I disagree because the Rangers were in that conversation. The Panthers were in that conversation. The Stars were in that conversation. The Hell, even the Canucks were in that conversation. But yeah. then to say, I, I just think it's just media bias when people go into that, you know, going towards what they were saying. But I think retrospectively, though, the Oilers... I, they threw a lot of people off guard. I did not mm-hmm. think they were going to make it this far. And yet, here they are. There's Connor yeah. McDavid and his first Stanley Cup. But then the question becomes, do the Oilers actually deliver? Does McDavid actually step up this time? Because there's a lot of question marks about the uh, about both sides. Like One side is, will Edmonton be able to hoist the sixth Stanley Cup? Will Connor McDavid be in the list of like some of the greatest players of all time? you know, to win a Stanley Cup. Mm-hmm. And the other narrative is, well, because the Panthers are back in the finals again, aren't they just going to be the Buffalo Bills? 
where they go four straight years and they lose. Right. I don't know. But I, I, I'm i very much in the comforting spot about all this and to say I think this is going to be a great series no matter who you're rooting for. Yeah, same here. And it's kind of tough to tell who's going to win the cup this year with these two teams going at it. Would I like to see McDavid finally get the cup? Sure. It would be great. You know, they have a great fan base up there. However, if I look at it on a depth um, aspect of everything, and when I look at total team performance, I almost have to give Florida the edge in this one. And, and that's kind of where I'm going in, the, in what I'm thinking, at least at this point, before we even drop the puck on game one. Uh, I, I would almost say for this series, I would say go the distance. I'm thinking Florida in seven. Mm, okay. So for me, here's how I look at it. I agree with you that I think Florida has a much bigger team in terms of depth. Edmonton is solely McDavid and Dreisaitl and, and Zach Hyman. And maybe Skinner. And, <laughs> and maybe Stuart Skinner. But I feel like everyone else around them, I feel like the Oilers, as good as they are this year, I don't know if they're good enough to say, "Hey, we're def- we're definitive, you know, favorites to win the Stanley Cup." Because a lot of betting, you know, websites have the Panthers winning the series. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'm not going to put all, all my eggs in one basket, but I think in Edmonton's defense, you know, guys like Evan Bouchard, Darnell Nurse, Cody CC have all stepped up on the blue line for the Oilers. Matias Ekholm, I need to mention that. Um, I think with Edmonton, their defense is really sta- is you know staggering in a lot of ways, similar to Florida. But the Panthers are just so stacked. But the thing is, they already know what it's like to be in the Stanley Cup Finals. They were just there a year mm-hmm. ago. Yep. So and, and they won it not that long ago. Well, they didn't well, win the cup. It, well, okay, it's been a while. I know what you mean. Have, but they've been in the playoffs. They've had some good runs. Yeah, they have. I mean, they've made it far in the playoffs before, but not to that extent. But I think though now where the Panthers stand, they have a very good opportunity to win the Stanley Cup because I was solely convinced that uh, Florida was going to win it last year against Mm -hmm. Vegas, but that didn't really work out. But this year, I'm definitely counting my eggs on this. I'm definitely putting the Florida Panthers in this conversation. I think they're going to win the Cup in six games. Okay. Well, we'll definitely see how things tend to pan out, but it'll be an interesting conversation either way, you know, especially once we start getting – underway with the with the puck chop but what i will say next though and uh wonder how rob hazy's taking the news uh joe pavelski has decided to uh retire after 18 seasons in the league he is not handling it very well yeah. i mean I, i'll put it this way joe pavelski had a great career in the nhl he really did and then he was on san jose for like 15 plus years yeah and then he was part of that original core. In fact, he was a member of that 2016 Sharks team that went to the Cup Finals yeah. when they lost to Pittsburgh. You know, they had guys like, uh, you know, Joe Bavelski, Joe Thornton, uh, Patrick Marlowe. They had mm-hmm. Mark Revising in his prime. They had Brent Burns in his prime, Martin Jones. They were really good that year. But ultimately, they got beat by the Penguins. And it, it, most importantly, though, they were basically uh, – key contributors to that Stanley Cup team even though they didn't win it but they they had a really good team that year but they just happened to come through and sure enough they did it yeah so but he's gonna leave on a good note and of course Pavelski great career all together with uh, looking back at it so good to see but here's an interesting thing Utah they actually have a temporary logo for this season and they actually did put out the season ticket pricing and guess what it's not four hundred dollars a fucking seat like it was in Arizona at, at well, that college arena. Oh, I didn't see that. How much are they? Uh, how much are they charging? Um, average between like in a lower bowl between like one forty and maybe two fifty at the most. Okay, that's not too bad. Yeah, it's I pretty mean, average with like most buildings. Well, you don't want to put them up too much of a of a drop because of the fact that you know it's still a team that still has to get used to the market and all that. Because what if they're bad and you overprice it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, that's exactly what happened. Why they couldn't sell out Mullet Arena? Yeah, that's Plus, true. Their original owner was a dumbass too. Of course he was. But regarding the Utah Hockey Club, that's temporarily what they're going to be called until 2025. 
Um, they have a new logo, and I wish we had a way we could like show it off on Spotify or whatever without you know the audio. But for those of you who want to know, or unless you haven't seen it yet, is there's four different variants. They all have one thing in common. They all say Utah, which that was what they were suspecting it was going to mm-hmm. be for a while, was Utah Hockey Club. The first logo, the one that merged out from the mist, was it's a, it's a blue circle with a black outline circle, and it says hockey on one side, club on the bottom, and in the middle in black it says Utah. And then there's another one in reverse, but it has the state map of Utah on it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really sure how they're going to do this. Like, they're just going to – they're basically taking the route the commanders did a few years ago where when they were forced to scrap the Redskin name and obviously the NFL at that time was really pushing the, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, that that's exactly what's happening here. But it's not real – you know, it's not due to racial things. It's more of just because they don't want to keep the Coyotes' name. Yeah, and you know what? Hey, it's a good thing. Utah's a new team, new identity. Go for it. You know, you're, they already have fan support, so that's a big plus. Way more than Arizona ever gave them, so, <laughs> you know, they'll do fine. They'll do good. And actually, just a little bit of a brand-new uh, story that just came out. Uh, the NHL is going to broadcast uh, this year's Stanley Cup final in American Sign Language, for which will make it the very first team ever to actually have that as a capability. That's awesome. So good to hear. Good stuff. But really, before we jump into baseball, there's one other um, story that came out um, this week. And the Sabres and Devils are looking at possibly making some trade options here. Yeah, I read that. And apparently there's a lot of rumors that came out from Elliot Freeman. He basically said that there's a lot of chatter in Buffalo about the 11th overall pick in play. And he said that the Sabres' first-round pick is in play. He said there's a lot of talk around Buffalo. And he says, I think the Sabres' run office knows that next year is to make it or break it for them, and that can force you into thinking of things. And the, one of the possibilities of names that was brought up from mm-hmm. Jeff Merrick, mind you, on sports, that he said Martin Neches. And he said, quote, I wouldn't normally wonder about a team like the Buffalo Sabres. Eventually, Buffalo has to turn a lot of the prospects and draft capital into something here, and they have a lot of it. But I don't think any of that works for the Carolina Hurricanes. But exactly what are you trying to give up? Are you trying to give up half of the farm, including the first-round pick? Right. Because there's there's a lot of like moving parts about what the Sabres do here. And the Devils, um, I would think the Devils are probably going to use this on a goalie like they did on Corey Schneider all those years ago. Mm-hmm. Right. We'll I mean, especially with parting ways with Vitek Vanacek. So, I mean, there you go. I mean, that that is something there. But it was also interesting because I was reading on Yard Barker um, earlier this week, and James Nichols of the New Jersey Hockey Now had even speculated um, a potential trade. And they were thinking that, well, he was thinking that the Devils need a top six forward and some help on the blue line. And, of course, goaltending is a big thing he mentioned. But um, one of the things he mentioned with, with Buffalo is that um, – Matthias Samuelson and he and they were saying it would his speculation was it would take more than the 10th overall pick to get him uh, as part of a deal which I mean when you're looking at 4.285 million a year I mean yeah you're gonna want a bigger return than just a 10th pick in Matthias Samuelson Right. And the other thing, too, I've also read, and this is going to be news to you, mind you, until today, is supposedly there is a uh, YouTube channel that came out with an article from Top Shelf Hockey. Mm-hmm. And he was saying that there's a possibility because of Mitch Marner. We talked about it last week about how um, that he was willing to put out nine teams on his no trade list or whatever it was yeah. he didn't want to go to. One of the teams, everyone was saying, you know, Chicago, Utah. The, you know, national, yeah, the casual. Yeah, some are saying Buffalo, of course. Yeah, Buffalo. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going with this. So it was being said that the Buffalo Sabres are a possible candidate for Mitch Marner. Mm-hmm. And the price, yeah, I swear to God when I heard that. I'm like, how are you going to make this work? Because first off, I understand giving up the first overall pick, the 11th pick. That's, that's not surprising. Mm-hmm. But what is, though, surprising to me is who would they possibly give up for him? And the name that has been going around as of late, I don't know if you've heard this, was Dylan Cousins. Okay. So yeah. if you give up Dylan Cousins for Mitch Marner, I'd honestly be okay with that. 
I probably would be too. But here's the thing. It's not going to just cost you, you know, cousins and a first. Right. You would have to give up maybe a couple of more picks and some prospects. Right. Because that's a big thing the Leafs are lacking are prospects. Yeah. A lot of teams are lacking on prospects. And a lot of the teams in the league would kill to have the prospects the Buffalo mm-hmm. Sabres currently have right now. It's insane. Here's here's three I can think of right off the top that Toronto would probably want. They would either want Matt Savoy, Isaac Rosen, or Yuri Coolidge. They would probably want one of them. I would probably suspect that they're going to want someone that would want to fill in the role for Marner. I personally think I would prefer to give up Rosen because I haven't heard his name in three years. Right. And he hasn't really fully developed. Same with Savoy. Savoy was drafted two years ago, so and he's turning 21 pretty soon. Yeah. So I'm not that all in. I'm mean, not saying I don't want to give him up. That's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But if you're willing to give up a player for a guy like Mitch Marner, you have to be very careful what you're doing because this is a division rival and they're only two and a half hours from you so you have to play you know fire with fire you have to play hard to get and this is the game the buffalo sabers if they're willing to do it would have to play you would have to give Mm -hmm. up a fan favorite like cousins you would have to give up at least a good portion of your prospects and most importantly you're also going to be giving toronto leverage for possibly the 11 overall pick Mm -hmm. yeah I could totally see it. I would definitely not want to part with Coolidge because, I mean, he has been up here and he has played well in his sense up here, at which he could very well be close to making a big club at some point in the very near future. But to your point, I haven't heard as much of Savoy, and I definitely have not heard as much of Rosen, you know, during the time since they've been drafted. So I would be more comfortable letting one of those two go versus Coolidge. But again, you know, it's nice to know that we're not on that no trade clause. So at least that's a positive. Thank God. So there is, there is a positive there, but um, that being said, we're actually almost right at the half hour. So let's jump into baseball real quick because we have another, gambling story and uh san diego now no longer has the services of infielder uh to capita marcano because he's been banned for life for gambling (laughs) he pulled a pete rose damn it and apparently he actually sucked at gambling because he only won four percent of his bets still you mean what kind of stupid shit is that i mean I mean, have any of you learned anything from the Otani situation not too long ago? Yeah, exactly. If you learned anything, blame it on the fucking interpreter. <laughs> yeah, the interpreter is probably going to jail. Yeah. That's number one. Probably. And, number... and the interpreter yeah. will be banned for life. We know that. <laughs> well, he's going to get Pete Rose and he doesn't even play a game. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. But, no, it's, yeah, well... Marcano didn't really do too much during his career, and he played in Pittsburgh, and he played in a couple other spots, but good job, man. You got banned for life. (laughs) God damn it. I mean, what is with baseball players betting on games? Like, what is there to rig? Oh, make sure you throw a lower pitch here and a knuckleball here, there. Or maybe, like, maybe hit someone in the ass and and give them a base or something. I mean, like, why? <laughs> it's such a joke. I mean, it, it's a joke. Like, I can't even confiscate that. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. people take it seriously. But mm. at the same time, it's pure stupidity to be betting on games, especially if you're an athlete. It's yeah. one thing if you're not playing in the league anymore and you haven't been in over 30 years and you're just minding your own business as a private citizen. But if you're playing in arguably one of the biggest leagues in professional sports, then chances are very high that you're already making tens of millions of dollars and you want to make double of that by losing certain games or winning certain games or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, come on. Yeah, seriously. So, well, that's the end of his career. But I will say real quick, I know you saw that one clip I sent you, Yamamoto snaring that that 104.8-mile line drive off the bat. (laughs) Oh, yeah. If you haven't seen it, that was sick. Yeah, that's quick reflexes right there for sure. Yeah. But the other thing, too, I saw was uh, was Paul Skeens because I think the Pirates are playing the Dodgers, and he struck out Shohei Otani with, like, a, like with a fiery pitch or something like that. Yeah. And Otani was impressed until, like, later in the game where it might have been a different pitcher, and he just swung it. And I'm just like, well, there goes that. Yep, exactly. I'll tell you, Skeens, he's, he's having a hell of a season so far <laughs> after making his debut. 
Well, yeah. I mean, I think he was drafted like a year ago or something, and he's already in the majors. Yeah. He's Pittsburgh's best pitcher. <laughs> By far. I mean, I would say close. him and David Bednar, those are their two best pitchers on the starting rotation. Yeah, it's not even close. <laughs> so, with that, it's interesting how fast a half hour goes. Um, but And one more thing, the yeah. Mets suck. Oh, Jesus, don't remind me of how they blew that game against the Nationals. <laughs> oh, my God. That was embarrassing on its own. That was, oh. And how the hell you cannot throw to the base properly? Come on. I I don't even know. I, I can't help you there. And they wonder why attendance is down 25% at City Field. Hey, ownership. You have a crap ton of money. You're spending at the luxury tax, and you're drafting shit. <laughs> well, there's that. Yeah. Well. Anyways, <laughs> we got a nice little offer from Justition. Check it out. We'll be back in about thirty seconds. I'm Tom Wujek, co-host of Buffalo After Dark. Founded by Matthew Keeler, Edition is a Buffalo-based fashion label focusing on continuous experimentation in hockey. Their work consists of products, content, and experiences that inspire creativity. Playful curation provides energy that sparks a unique perspective and an ideology around seeing the game differently. Now you can save. Log on to justition.com and use promo code WUJEK at checkout. You'll save 10% on all of your purchases. That is spelled W-U-J-E-K. Dishon has built an influential following devoted to the infusion of creative expression through high quality goods and tasteful collaboration. If you love creative products that push the boundaries, check out Dishon. Visit their website at justition.com. All right, welcome back to Buffalo After Dark. You got myself, you got Hanson. We're here for another half hour, and we're going to jump into football because there is a lot of interesting stuff that came out this week. And we want to jump right into it because there's been some interesting deals. And, and all I can tell you, one of the first things that happened, Waddle got paid. And oh, big paid time. Big time. Oh, yeah, he got paid the big boy bucks. I mean, Jalen Waddle got what, like four years and $84.75 yeah, million? Dollars? Something crazy. Yeah, and I think he's guaranteed seventy-six million. If I remember reading that correctly, I mean the Miami Dolphins are in a very interesting position because there's been a lot of chatter lately that Tyreek Hill wants to make more money than Justin Jefferson, who we'll talk about in a second. And he's just like, "Yo, I want to be paid more money," but yet he's like, "I want to be paid more money, but I also don't want to be greedy." Like Tyreek, you say a lot of stupid shit, mm -hmm. and let's be honest with ourselves here. The only reason that Tyreek Hill is asking for more money than possibly making more than Jetta is simply because so that he can pay off his baby mamas. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so here's the deal with what we got with Jalen Waddle's contract: uh, three years, eighty um, eighty-four million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. It includes an eighteen million eight hundred seventy-three thousand dollars signing bonus, seventy-six million guaranteed. Close enough. I mean, it's still a really good deal for the Dolphins. Like, that's, to me, like, a very friendly deal. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. That's a lot of money. I will yeah. tell you that. Yeah, and uh, the Dolphins are very interested in what they do moving forward because they just paid Waddle. Okay, you're set for right there. Yeah. But then you got to pay Tyreek, and then mm -hmm. you got to pay Tua. But there's been a lot of chatter, and I've mentioned it on the show a handful of times, and I kept saying it and saying it and saying it, and it hasn't happened yet, is the Dolphins are going to give Tua over $50 million for, like, five years. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying, like, where is this contract? Because the Dolphins need to pay Tua. Yeah. Unless they're not sold on him, which I think they are, then what do you do in that situation? True story. I mean, do you let him go? Do you keep him? I mean, he's lucky he's gotten to this point in the NFL because he really doesn't have that arm. And no. plus, he got his bell rung enough times, too. It's like, originally, remember, like, two seasons ago, we thought that he was going to get murdered on the Dolphins just because of how many concussions he was having? I still believe that, even though I don't wish that on anybody because that's a really serious injury. Right. I'll never forget the game. I think it was two years ago. It was around the time we went to Kansas City, mm -hmm. or it might have been two weeks prior. And this was, like, during the Heatway game against Buffalo, yeah. where Matt Milano comes in and hits him, and... Uh, Tua was wobbling, and they were saying, oh, it's a bag injury. And they patted him down, and they said, all right, you're good to go. And then that was the one yeah. time the Dolphins beat the Bills. And then two weeks later, they go on primetime against the Bengals, 
the whiteout game, the first one ever. Yeah, he gets and destroyed. Then, and he got destroyed, yeah. He got body slammed into the ground, and he was in a fetal position. And I remember this, mm-hmm. and I'm like, the Dolphins are going to kill this guy. Yeah. They're going to kill him, and there's going to be a serious problem if he dies. And lucky for him, and I think he had three concussions that year too, if I remember. Yeah, it was something crazy because I remember the one time he was stumbling and he almost he couldn't even like almost walk off the field. He like literally fell down, and then yeah, and then the fetal position. I thought he he was done at that point. Yeah, and then it happened to him again two years ago on Christmas against the Packers, and I remember the yeah. saying to myself like, "Oh my God, they're really trying to kill Tua here," but then mm-hmm. two years later, it's like, "Wow." It's amazing how far he's come. I mean, I respect that about Tua, that he was very committed, very stubborn about where he wanted to be with Mm -hmm. the Miami Dolphins. But it's like, well, I want to play football. I mean, lucky him. He got Jalen Waddle and he got himself Tyreek Hill. He's got probably the two fastest wide receivers in the game right now. And I think it's probably why a big part of it is why the Dolphins are so keen on signing him. Exactly. It's just a matter of now, how much money do you put at him? That that's really what's going to come down to, and and of course, there's the Dolphins. They're still going to have to build their depth in the in in the roster because they're really not, other than some specific pieces, they're really not that great. Especially when you look at the offense as a whole, and they're not that great defensively as a whole. Yes, they do some good things. Yes, they do have some really solid players, but they don't have the depth like you would find with a Kansas City or some of the other championship teams. San Francisco even has way more depth than what Miami has. Yeah, and speaking of San Francisco, I'm glad you brought that up because the other day it was reported that Christian McCaffrey just signed a two-year extension that would give him $38 million per year to you know by the 49ers. Great but- move. Absolutely. I mean, that's a that's a good move, and it's the right one to make. But mm-hmm. back to Miami, and that is the Dolphins are just somewhere in the middle. It's like, how are people going to take you seriously if you were up by three games in the division late in November Yeah, and you blow it? Right. And the Bills luckily peaked at the right time to basically take out Miami. They did. But they were, they yeah, were really good. Yeah. They literally had to win out. And they did. But at the same time, it's like, okay, Miami, you're such a, you say you're such a good team, but you got your ass handed to you by the Bills at the end of the regular season. You got your ass handed to you in the playoffs (laughs) on top of it. It's like, no one takes you seriously. I agree. But the other question then becomes is like, do you think that they'll have buyers and worse if like, let's say for the sake of argument that the Dolphins do sign Tyreek? Because I think they're looking into doing this because he has said himself that he wants to uh, be a, a host like on Twitch or something. And he also wants to do porn. I'm like, that's oh, not important. That's like a post retirement thing. You don't go around telling people that that's like inappropriate for anybody to know that. But that's mm-hmm. what Tyreek did in that situation yeah. like a year ago yeah. when he's like, oh, when my car drink and I want to do all that. And I'm just like, dude, come on. It's like we don't need to know you want your dick hanging out or anything like that. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. And not to mention be playing with little kids or teenagers yeah. on Twitch like Fortnite or something oh. like that. Yeah, exactly. But, but hey, they got paid, so you know it's not all all bad in the end. But we'll see what they do depth wise. But then on the flip side, talk about not getting paid. How about Mike Brown being a cheap ass? Mike Brown is a total cheap ass for sure. But before we get to the Bengals, we forgot to mention the biggest signing of the week: Justin Jefferson. Mm-hmm. Justin Jefferson got paid. And I mean paid. The mm-hmm. dude got paid four years, $140 million, which guarantees him $110 million, which if you do the math, that's $35 million per year. Whew. That's a lot of money. Yeah, that's going to be a few Brinks trucks. <laughs> yep. Job. So, yep, and he's now the highest paid non-quarterback position player in the NFL ever, even surpassing DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, except too bad the Vikings don't have anyone else around them. <laughs> well, that's kind of a them problem. Well, I mean, to be fair, they do have no, T.J. Hawkinson. Not horrible. <laughs> no, but Hawkinson's a beast, dude. Yeah, I mean, he's a good player. You mean, you have Hawkinson, you have Jetta, you have Jordan Addison. I would agree 
on the whole, you know, offense thing, but I feel like they need to do more than that. I mean, I do agree with you in an extent, but outside of that, nobody really can name anything about the Vikings outside right. of just Jada and, you know, JJ McCarthy. Yeah. You know, sorry, but anyways, back to Mike Brown. We know he's, yep, a cheap Mike. <laughs> okay. So for the context of it, there is a concern that's going around. And again, going back to two episodes ago, about a disaster brewing in Cincinnati. And that is that the Bengals owner, Mike Brown, who is the son of the late Paul Brown, Mm -hmm. is reluctant to hand out big contracts to keep all their star players, including guys like Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Trey Hendrickson. And as of considered by statistics, Mike Brown is the poorest owner in the NFL. And they are all waiting on their contracts. So Hendrickson, Chase, and Higgins all want new deals. Uh, Cincinnati is going to be in uh, purgatory for a while. Well, I mean, the other thing, too, is Joe Burrow cannot restructure his contract until next year because his new deal doesn't kick in yet. Nope. And, of course, so, you know, he ain't going to want to restructure probably, so. He would be incredibly lucky if he does at this point. But yeah. the Bengals are in a deep shit situation. Like, yeah, I think the Bengals can be competitive, mm-hmm. but – with all these players wanting new contracts, they're going to need it because guess what else? Not only is Mike Brown the cheapest owner in the NFL, he's also the general manager of the Cincinnati Bengals, and he's like 90 years old. Oh, my God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Bengals fans. <laughs> You're oh, going to need it. <laughs> oh, God. Cincinnati. Oh. Yeah, Cincinnati's going to be in purgatory pretty soon. <laughs> yep, and for anyone that um, is outraged by that uh, little uh, thing just right now, well, we do have that disclaimer. We're not responsible for anything, so you can all basically kiss our ass on that. <laughs> oh, it's yeah, an opinion-based sure. show. <laughs> We're not forcing religion or anything on anybody. No, we know that. But, but the thing is, though, is that the Bengals are in such a crap situation. They can't even get anybody to stay. Hendrickson wants a new deal. Higgins wants a new deal. Two of them, both of them requested trades during the draft. And Jamar Chase is one year away from being a UFA. Mm-hmm. And they need to re-sign him because the Bengals are in deep shit and they don't have anybody else that they can really count on. It's very true. And right now with how they're looking... It's not going to be a good time for Bengals fans for a while. And I will say, there's a lot of good Bengals fans, and we've been there. We know they're passionate about the team, but, man, Mike Brown, you suck as an owner. It's insane. But, I mean, Bengals fans are great, but the team as a whole, they're going to be in purgatory for a while. Yeah. Speaking of purgatory, the Jaguars? Oh, my God. (laughs) Because think of it this way. Basically, at this point, Jaguars have some issues uh, with some of their players, and one of the things that we will say is that there's a little thing called substance abuse, and apparently it's pretty rampant on the team. Yeah, definitely. So reports are coming out, and this kind of goes back to what we said a week ago about the whole Brandon McManus thing, who, by the way, got the Matt Ariza treatment where allegations Mm -hmm. and investigations were going on, and he gets booted off the team a week after it came out saying of all the things he allegedly did to these women when they are in the London trip last year. So he got the same treatment Ariza did. But anyways, so marijuana and alcohol were being used on the Jacksonville Jaguars team plane back from London. And according to the case where Brandon McNass allegedly sexually assaulted a flight attendant, those two substances are a major no by the National Football League, and the team will most likely face a punishment, according to NBC. What a shithole. Yeah, exactly. And this is after, so, and this is after Khan's going to spend over a billion dollars to redo their stadium. Yep, and they're getting a major renovation in their stadium, and you also have a domestic abuser as a kicker, allegedly. So this whole yeah. marijuana alcohol thing is starting to make sense because if the alle- if the allegations are anywhere near true, because I still don't want to be biased and say, oh, he's a criminal, because these are just allegations, and they're pretty serious allegations. But mm-hmm. if you're making a strong case for marijuana and alcohol, I'm pretty sure by the state of Florida, if I'm not – if I'm not mistaken, 
I'm pretty sure marijuana is illegal. Yeah, as far as I know, it's not legalized in that state yet. No, you you'll most likely find it in like in the blue states like New York, California, Colorado, etc., mm-hmm. Washington. But well, I don't know. I find that a little hard to believe because of the fact that, like I was saying, you know, weed is not legal in the state of Florida, but yet the Jaguars somehow got their hands on it. Well, but then again, you figure, hey, the players have a ton of money. They know where to find it. Oh, I'm sure of that. But how are you able to get through, you know, security, you know, unless they don't have to go through security, you know, when they go on their private jet or whatever? I don't know. It, it, it's very, very interesting to me to see a situation like this unfold. I, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I honestly don't know where to begin with the whole ordeal with the Jaguars because, well, it's Jacksonville. They come in full of surprises every year. Right. And, you know, at this point, they're, you know, they're going to deal with it for a while. But, yes, and I don't know if you saw renderings of what the stadium renovation is going to look like. They're trying to copy SoFi. <laughs> I have. I've seen it now for over two months. So the deal is, and I know what you're talking about because I've seen it, I think the project as a whole will cost about $1.4 billion to do in a major renovation to TIAA Bank Stadium in Jacksonville. And the plan is to have the Jaguars temporarily relocate to Orlando in 2025 and 26 and once they do that they'll go back to the stadium in 2027 where that will be completely done with renovations so it'll be kind of like what happened with the saints during hurricane katrina where when the superdome got flooded they weren't allowed to play in it because of the major um you know the major damage that was done during hurricane sand um it's any hurricane Katrina. That's what I'm about to say over a little over under 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. So the saints had to play all of their games on the road in old five. And I was in middle school when this happened, I was in seventh grade. And next thing you know, and I remember looking at the saints and I said, damn, I got to play all their road games on the road for the mm-hmm. one season. They weren't even able to play a home game temporarily. Right. But I guess in the state of Louisiana, they weren't even able to do that at the time. Yeah. There's a lot of work that had to go into it at that point, but but it'll be interesting to see what they do with that whole project. I mean, yes, it should make you know that whole stadium in a better spot. And actually, real quick before we um, take on our last topic of the night, um, one year ago today was the groundbreaking of the new Bills um, Highmark Stadium. Yeah, that's for sure, and, and it's coming at full speed. Yeah, and they're already almost one level complete, and now they're going to start building out. You know, it's still two more years to go on the project, but most of the lower seating bowl. F- is actually at least roughed in at this point. So it's kind of interesting seeing what's going to happen. The field is still below street level like the current stadium, but on the flip side, it's not as deep as what the current stadium is. So who knows what will happen with, like, the winds and all that stuff once it opens. But it's still it's interesting to see it coming along as quick as it is and, you know, interesting to see, like, some of the first sections get roughed in. So. Without a doubt. I mean, I'm excited what the new, uh, what the new stadium is going to look like when it's fully done. A lot of people that I've spoken to locally who are football fans, none mm-hmm. of them have any idea that the Bills were getting a new stadium. And I had to show them the renderings. It's like, oh wow, that's a cool looking stadium. And I'm like, wait, you're not, you're a Jets fan, but you live in New York State, but right. you didn't know the Bills were getting a new stadium. I thought you knew this. Mm-hmm. Guess not. Right. And it's weird because, at least in Buffalo, it was all over the place in terms of the new stadium, which now the costs have gone up, and it's it's almost $2 billion at this point. But That's insane. Yeah, exactly. Although, apparently, Depressed Ginger likes the fact that it's an outdoor stadium. So, <laughs> as much as I don't think he likes to research a lot of stuff, and that's just my own opinion, but... But he did give it some credit, and then he, he actually did mention on his channel our last topic, which is the 2028... NFL draft might actually be here in Buffalo. If the draft is in Buffalo, I am deeply considering going. But um, well, I guarantee you, I will be there if it's up here. Well, yeah, of course you live there, so yeah, I like, will. I will definitely drive the half hour to it. There is no question on that. I will grab the Thursday and Friday night tickets. I will go both nights. I have no problem doing that. Hell, even with the one coming up in Pittsburgh, I want to go to that when that when that comes up. I think in uh, was it twenty twenty six? 
Yeah, 2025 is Green Bay. 2026 yeah. is Pittsburgh, which was just announced last week. And then this week, I think it was either last week or the, earlier this week. I think it was this week because today's what, Wednesday? So Monday must have came out that there was a report that the Bills want to host the 2028 NFL Draft. And I think a good part of this would have to do something with either showing off the new stadium or mm-hmm. they want to bring in revenue money to Buffalo so that people can come down to the city because they don't really get a lot of big things in that city. You know, right. they don't get to host big events like, you know, the Super Bowl or anything like that. So I think for them to host the draft would be a nice idea, but it's not guaranteed that they're going to get the draft. But how are they going to get the 2028 draft if there's no declared winner for 2027? Right. That's the thing it will be interesting to find out. Who is getting a draft in 2027? <laughs> I mean... Right now, we know Pittsburgh's got 2026. We know Lambeau's going to be the next one. 2027 is a crapshoot. 2028 would possibly be Buffalo. Well, let's go back in time when they started doing this. So 2017, the first year was in Cleveland. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. Yeah, wait. Okay, you know what it is? I'm getting it confused. I think 2020, uh, 2017, I think, was in Philadelphia. That's what I think it was. 2018 was in Dallas, 2019 was in Nashville, 2020 was virtual because of the COVID pandemic, yep. 2021, um, I forget where that is, 2022 was, I think, Kansas City, if I remember correctly, 2023 was, God, I don't even remember, dude, like, do you remember? Um. So so let's, let's see. Because... Well, last year was, I think, in Detroit. Well, no, this year was in Detroit. This past year was Detroit. The year this past year was, was Kansas, Detroit. The year before was Kansas City. And who was the year before that? In 2021. Uh... I know 2020 was, was virtual. It was... It, oh, no! You know what it was? It was Las Vegas because they were supposed to... Yeah. Uh, they were supposed to have the 2020 uh, draft in Las Vegas, but then it got pushed back, mm-hmm. I think, a year. And then that's where they had the vaccination thing, and then it's like, oh, if you want to go to the draft, you have to get the vaccine or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and actually... Um, one of the sites, and this is actually a Kansas City fan site, Arrowhead Addict, they're actually speculating uh, potentially Denver for 2027. Denver? Interesting. Which, oh, that, right. that would be if that if that is actually true. Well, I don't, I haven't heard anything else as far as the NFL draft. I think it would be a really bad idea. It just my personal opinion is putting a team in Florida for the draft. It's one thing to have the Super Bowl, but mm-hmm. it's another when you have the draft because the draft. Think about it in April. It's usually go- it's like scorching hot, and right. there's going to be people outside. You need to get good access of water and shade in Florida if you're going to do the NFL draft, especially in broad daylight. You know, during round like four through seven or something like that that year. So I don't see it happening in Florida. I would not be surprised, though. In 2027, my prediction for the NFL draft, where I think it's going to take place, and I'm calling it now, Seattle. That's an interesting thought. Actually, I'll throw one other one out there. 2027 supposedly is when Nashville has their brand new Dome Stadium. I would not be surprised if they possibly put it there because where that new stadium's going is next door to the current Nissan stadium. And apparently as far as I've heard, the new stadium also will carry the Nissan stadium name. So it looks like kind of similar to what Buffalo did, how the new stadium is also going to be called Highmark stadium. But yeah, the way they're going to set that up is that of course the current Nissan stadium is going to be torn down once the new dome stadium opens. I would not be surprised because what they're going to do, they have a huge entertainment district on both sides of the river. I would not be surprised if they try to put it there. And here's the other thing. If they do it outdoors, even if it's not at the brand new stadium, the state, like right on the river, there's this, there's a ton of park area that they could easily get probably 500,000 plus in there. Well, the other thing too, you have to consider, right? Is you said Tennessee, right? You Mm -hmm. said they already hosted the draft in 2019. I would say if Seattle is out of the question for an NFL draft, I would not be surprised if New Orleans gets thrown around there. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Yeah, New Orleans, I could definitely see. I could also see Houston being a possibility. But I was just going to go there with that, too. I was thinking Houston could be an option. What would your thoughts be on if L.A. were to host it? 
They don't need anything else. They just hosted the Super Bowl a couple years ago. Yeah, good I'm point. just throwing it out there. I mean, so far, I get it. It's a great stadium, and people have said nothing but great things about it. Mm -hmm. But you got to give other teams a chance. Right. And, I mean, the NFL draft was just in Chicago. Or, yeah, no. Yeah, they, ha they yeah, have it had it Detroit. in Chicago. And then yeah, that's Detroit right. this past year, uh, this just a couple months, like within the last month or so. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, there's a lot of teams with options. Like, New England wouldn't be a bad option yeah, for a draft. Boston, yeah. Yeah, Boston, that would be nice. Um, I also wouldn't be surprised if Cincinnati gets a shot. I mean, there's a possibility for that. Mm -hmm. so, I don't know. It's it's just all speculation. But I'm, I'm going to probably say Denver would probably be the best bet for the NFL draft. But we won't fully know that yet until, like, the next year or whatever. Yeah. But it would be interesting. At least, you know, they're throwing it around as a possible option. And I wouldn't mind having it here. I would totally go to that. Absolutely would make, make the time to go to that. In fact, yeah, Wes, without you'd, a doubt. You'd, you'd probably be giving me a shot. I was like, hey, can I come up and stay a couple days for the draft? <laughs> Absolutely. Hell, even though, like, I would say, yeah, you totally would, I would probably crash at your place and be like, hey, can we join you for the draft or whatever? Yeah. You know, it's very, very possible, but we don't even fully know yet. I mean, again, I mean, I hope Buffalo does get the NFL draft in 2028, mm -hmm. but I'm not counting on it. But if they do, that's awesome. But we won't fully know until, like, next year. Right. I was going to say, what would your thoughts be if um, I were to head down to Pittsburgh for the draft? Do you want to come up? <laughs> well, it, uh, we don't know yet <laughs> because, you know, the Steelers are going to play the Bills in 2025. We just don't know when it is yet. But right. uh, but the thing is, Britt likes to go to different cities, but she wants to go to cities that we already be in at that point in time. Like, for example, like – you and I are doing Road to 32 in the end of the, of uh, July, yep. right? So we're going to the Phillies game. Mm -hmm. So at that point, because Britt and I already did Philadelphia to see the Eagles, and because you haven't been there yet, because you've always been in favor of Pittsburgh your whole life, mm -hmm. and I'm generous enough to take you to Philadelphia, that's something because I've been there. I know what it's right. like. So at that point – it would have to depend on like when the game is. You know what I'm saying? Like if we don't go to Pittsburgh in 2025, I would say maybe or maybe not. I'm not sure, but I think that's like two years down the road, though. Yeah. I'm not really sure. <laughs> exactly, but it's still an interesting thought, though. Maybe it's like who knows if they if Buffalo and Pittsburgh both have drafts over the next few years. Hey, actually get to say, hey, I've gone to two NFL drafts. Oh yeah, it's definitely possible. I mean, we have to just hope for the best. That that's the best mm -hmm. way I could put it. For sure. I mean, I still remember that the NHL draft here in 2016. I mean, I enjoyed going to that for the first round, so that that was worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. And got to have a picture and shake hands with Noah Hannafin. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm waiting on, in terms of hockey, I'm waiting for the 2026 NHL All-Star Game at UBS Arena. Yeah, that'd be a good one. That'd be a good yeah. one. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I am remotely convinced now at this point that that UBS arena in terms of the NHL's eyes, I feel like it's going to become the NHL's new cash cow, especially with it being in New York, you know, in Long mm -hmm. Island and 45 minutes out of the, outside of the city, because you're not going to have the, I mean, unless they say we want to host the NHL all-star game in like 2034 or something at Madison square garden, then I could see the NHL all-star game or any other event like the draft or whatever being a centerpiece for the NHL for years to come since it's and I've said it to you before is they're becoming a hockey empire with how they're trying to take down the uh the Belmont stake you know mm -hmm. plate whatever I mentioned a while back yeah. knock it all down make a new co uh, parking or whatever and build other things in between to make it like this big utopian thing mm -hmm. so yeah. we really don't know yet yeah be fun to see how that all turns out as it starts happening so Oh, dude, I would love to take you to an hour of the game, you know, just for the sake of argument. I would love to take you to an hour of the game. Yes. Even if it's not against the Sabres, I would gladly take you to it. Right, right. Saw one in the old barn, which I, I was able to accomplish that before they shut the old barn down. So now yep. it's just a matter of see the new place at some point. So, Yep. And uh, there is one more piece of news, actually two, that mm -hmm. I want to mention. The first one is Hassan Rennick has not attended voluntary workouts for the New York Jets and has not been in contact with head coach Robert Sala, and he was just traded a month ago from the Eagles to the Jets. <laughs> Jesus. Well, he wants a new deal, and 
How much do you want to bet Robert Sala possibly doesn't make it through the rest of the season? If they don't make the playoffs, I'd say he's gone. But a lot of Jets fans are really banking on this year as like a must to go to the playoffs. I mean, it's kind of like the Buffalo Sabres. Either they don't make the playoffs or it's going to get really ugly fast. Mm -hmm. You know, it's similar ways. The Jets have much higher expectations than the Sabres. I mean, let's be completely honest. I mean, you have Aaron Rodgers. Hopefully he'll last more than 15 minutes <laughs> this season. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing you can only hope for at that point. Right. But, no, I, I have no, and I've said it before, and I'll say it numerous times throughout my life until the day I'm dead, is I have no remorse for the New York Jets. I fucking hate them. <laughs> but it's just the fact their fans are so obnoxious, and the fact I have to be neighboring with these degenerates is just insane to me. But – I do think, though, that if they stay healthy, I could see them possibly making the playoffs, but I'm not banking on them to make the playoffs because, you know, A-Rod had an injury not too long ago on his right foot, and a lot of Jets fans are fear-mongering that he might be fighting through an injury through training camp, and I'm just saying, okay, Jets fans, you might want to tell me something now while you still have a chance. Mm -hmm. So, I I mean, I don't know. We'll, We'll see how it plays out. I mean, it's not even a guarantee what happens with the Jets at this point, but... Then again, if they do fail, I wouldn't be surprised if Salah does get fired. Yep, yep. And then you mentioned there's one last story you wanted to talk about. Yes, I do. And it's not really a story. It's a feature. So what I want to tell you guys is I have officially uploaded, and I kept it in secret from Tom, and you're going to be the first to know this as long as with everybody else, is I actually just published the trailer for the Seattle Seahawks trip for Road to 32 on our channel. All right. Here we go. So I kept it in secret. I wanted to surprise you, and it's now on our YouTube channel. So if you nice. want to check that out, it is on YouTube over, over at Horns and Hooves Entertainment. It is the Road to 30 trailer for the Seattle Seahawks. Good stuff. So we're going to have some fun there. I mean, we've got the place all set. We've got our ride all set. We're basically ready to go. Flights oh, are all yeah. set. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah, same here. I mean, yeah, it's going to be a five-hour flight, but (laughs) it's all good. So, you know, it'll be a good time. I'm looking forward to it, and, you know, we'll have some fun for five days. So, so Without a doubt. I mean, there's there's a lot to look forward to in Seattle. Yeah, basically what's become the yearly tradition on this show, (laughs) the trip. (laughs) Yep, the three of us, you, me, and Britt. It's Mm -hmm. become a yearly thing for us, Mm -hmm. and we've done this now three years in a row. First year when our inaugural, you know, trip together two years ago, our inaugural season mm-hmm. of Road to 32, the unofficial title at the time was um, Kansas City. And then yep. the following year, which was last year, yep. was Cincinnati. Cincinnati. So, and Rob joined us last year, and then he, he wasn't able to join us this coming year. But um, basically, yeah, this time it's Seattle. Yep, that's for sure. But if you look at it, it's crazy to think two years ago, We've already done the trip to Kansas City, and that's one mm. of the best videos I've ever published. Yeah. And that's gotten a lot of publicity, so that's great. Yeah. And then last year, we did Cincinnati, and that was a good trip all around. Mm. I really enjoyed Cincinnati. Yeah. And then this year coming up, we're going to the Pacific Northwest. We are going to the Emerald City in Seattle. Yeah. And hell, we'll even throw a day in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Yep, and we're just waiting for the schedule for the NHL, and once we find that out, we can actually book tickets to either the Vancouver Canucks or the Seattle Kraken, or both. Yeah, depending on what happens, So, which, honestly, I would love to see that arena in Seattle. I agree. Yeah, where the ice is completely underground. <laughs> You're basically taking an escalator underground to the seats. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm totally, uh, I'm totally, you know, just doing our own thing and then going from there. So (laughs) at at that point, you kind of just have to think, wow, I can't believe we're actually doing this again. And to think that for the first time ever, we're doing this on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I think that's remarkable because I think at that point, it would be the farthest we've ever journeyed. Aside from Britt and I, we've traveled to Ireland, but in terms of the United States or in Canada, yeah, you can most certainly count. This is the farthest yeah, we've done. To yeah, get. it's probably – God, I was looking at, like, how many sky miles I'm going to get. It's almost, like, 1,700 miles each way, so. Yeah, it's insane, the end. Yeah. You know, I, I'm excited to do this. Yep, same here. And uh, give a little shout-out. Thank you, Delta Airlines. We're happy to be flying with you guys. And even though we know you don't sponsor us, uh, 
you're our airline of choice this time around. Absolutely. So, that being said, I was going to say, um, any other things you want to talk about before we uh, wrap up for the night? Um, no, I think that's about it. And just in general, I am looking forward to the 2024 Stanley Cup Finals. It's going to be a modern classic, and I'm excited to see it and look at the outcome. No matter who wins, uh, it's going to be an exciting series. But like I said, before we go, I said the Florida Panthers in six, and you said the Oilers in seven, right? Mm, no, I said uh, Panthers, Panthers in seven. You're right, you're right. My mistake. So we both said Panthers, but you said seven, I said six. Yep, so... We'll see how okay. things pan out, but it'll be interesting, you know, either way. But with that being said, you know, thanks for everyone, uh, you know, for another week. We're happy to do it. And we're actually in our, we only have, I think, maybe five shows left before we go on our summer break. So, or yeah, and something like that. And that's including our 2024 NHL free agency frenzy, which is we usually cover as the last like show of the season and then yep. we reload in season five in september yep so so yeah not too much left before our break so then of course as we go forward they keep it here we'll of course break some stories as it comes out but in the meantime thanks again for joining us take care of yourselves and each other we will see you next week